So here we are again. This explains it. This is Hochstetter's map. And this is the area. I may not get to these volcanoes. I'll probably run out of time. But this is the main ones we're talking about down here. A tour tower here is in here mapped by Hochstetter. Smaller one, Puki, Pukiiti. And Mangataki Taki here for Ellet's Mountain, uh, shown as so. This is Pukitutu. Uh, Waitomokia here, Mangari Mountain, Mangari Lagoon. He also recognised several additional craters here and another volcano out here, but uh, subsequent work seems to suggest that this one, this one, and these uh, aren't actually volcanoes. Uh, that this was just a slight swampy depression, these two, and this is probably the top of the lava flow that came from Mangari Mountain. Uh, so I'll quickly go through the three styles of eruption that produce the volcanic landforms of the Auckland volcanoes. This here is just a shot at a Tuatara Historic Reserve. The first style of eruption, and I thank Margaret Morley for these uh, hand drawings that I'll be using, are the explosive eruptions. Or, and that is when the hot molten magma, deep down beneath us, 60 80 kilometres down, comes up towards the surface. It generally will encounter cold groundwater. And as you can imagine, extremely hot magma at about 1,000 degrees C, hitting cold water. It explodes, it fragments into many fine fragments. And as it explodes, it also fragments the country rock that it's coming up through and blasts it out. So we get a series of explosive blasts throwing out fragmented uh, volcanic magma and country rock into the air. Uh, a lot of it will fall to the ground quite close, especially the larger bits and gradually builds up layer upon layer of wet ash. As the wet ash dries, it hardens into a rock which we call tough, T-U-F-F. Some of that rock is blasted out sideways as pyroclastic surges, very powerful and the most dangerous part of an eruption that we expect from Auckland. Uh, that's very quickly that part. So here's a, an example of a, pyro, a uh, explosive eruption from this kind of volcano. This is Surtsey in Iceland. You can see a lot of ash going into the air, very dense ash lower down, building up a tough ring uh, in here around it. So the explosion crater is produced, and the falling ash produces this layer of wet ash around it, which hardens into a ring of tuff, and so we get a ring of tuff around a central explosion crater. If the uh, eruption stops at that stage, if the supply of magma stops at this stage, we get left with an uh, explosion craters like this that are sometimes called Ma craters. And there are 21 of them can be <coughs> identified in the Auckland volcanic field. Here's some more. This is Pukiwairiki on the East Tamaki. Uh, on the North Shore, only Poto at the Tank Farm here, and Panmure Basin in here are other examples of these kinds of eruption, each surrounded by a tough ring uh, with an explosion crater in the middle. Uh, here's a young hue here. Uh, showing you the layers of ash that built up a tough ring here at North Head. Each one of these layers represents an explosive blast, if you like. Some of these layers that are looking quite wiggly and fine grained there are wet, very wet pyroclastic surge deposits that were uh, blasted out sideways by these eruptions. Sometimes large blocks or pieces of the country rock are ripped off the throat of the volcano and thrown out as bombs or blocks as they can land in the fairly soft ash. Here we have the impact crater of this big block of country rock that was thrown out and landed. Sometimes that ash is very wet, and as it's in the ash cloud, those wet fragments of fine ash stick together and create these balls, and uh, they, they then rain back to the ground and land as uh, volcanic hailstones, if you like. Uh, accretionary lapilli, or chalazoidites, are other names for those. And these are from uh, Mangataki Taki, these ones. When all that groundwater that was interacting with the magma is used up by the explosive eruptions, then the eruption may be turn to a dry style of eruption. No water involved, and so we don't get the explosive blasts. Instead, the magma that's coming up from deep down below is molten rock, but dissolved in it also is a lot of, uh, of gas. So as the gas under pressure comes towards the surface, the pressure comes off, and what happens when the pressure comes off the liquid starts to come out of solution and, flop and froth up. If you think of a bottle of fizzy drink, it's got a lot of dissolved gas in it with the top on. Shake it up, take the top off, it comes out of solution and it fountains up, especially if you put your thumb over it, won't it? It produces a fountaining of the froth. The same thing happens here. As the pressure comes off, the gas comes out of solution and that fountaining of the, of the froth 
how's a fountaining eruption or fire fountaining or lava fountaining in this dry style of eruption. As that froth goes through the air, it cools and solidifies to a frothy rock called scoria, and that generally lands fairly close to the vent and gradually builds up a scoria cone like we see here. Here's we see some actual fountaining here in Hawaii. You can see the wind blowing from one direction to this, and here's the, the darker solidified froth, the scoria, falling back to the ground near the vent. And the scoria is quite loose and easy to, to cart away if you so it was in my mind. Most of that fire fountaining produced all the, the monga, or the, the cones we have in Auckland, they're all produced by fire fountaining, and they're all made of scoria. So the majority of the scoria that you see being used has come from the scoria cones. This, of course, is Mount Eden, and you can see that the angle of all the scoria cones is the angle of rest of the scoria, about a 30 degree angle. Similarly in the craters, usually about a 30 degree angle of slope is what we expect, which is the angle of rest. There were 33 uh, scoria cones in the Auckland volcanic field. 12 have been completely quarried away, and only one has had no quarrying whatsoever. So here's some more examples of them. Mungary Mountain, Mount Wellington, Mount Hobson here. And you'll know many others. And the third style of eruption is the quiet effusion of, of lava flows, and that is when most of that gas down here has come out of solution. We're left with the flat magma, the flat coat with very little gas dissolved in it. If that then rises up inside the vent and encounters the, the loose scoria, generally it will push its way through this loose scoria and start to flow out from the base of the scoria cone as a lava flow. So all the lava flows in Auckland's cones generally come out from the base of the cone. We know of no examples of the lava coming right up to the inside the crater and coming out over the top as they would in some of the, the other styles or kinds of volcanoes we have around the world. So here we have examples of the, the lava. The style of the lava depends on its heat and its viscosity. The hotter it is, the more liquid it is, and the faster it will flow. So these are some of the, the hotter lavas. As it's flowing along, it very quickly chills to a black glass on the outside. But as it's still molten on the inside and moving, you can see that glass is getting rucked up like the, the wrinkles on the top of a, of a pot of jam. And here we see some of that captured here in the rocks at Kiwi Esplanade at Mungari. This uh, style of lava flow is called Pahoehoe from Hawaii. If the, uh, the lava is a lot cooler, it will be far more viscous and flow a lot more slowly. So as it's flowing slowly, the outside builds up a very thick crust of cool, solid lava or basalt but it's being gradually moved along and broken up into many different hunks. And so if you were in Hawaii, there could be an active flow underneath that hot molten lava, still moving at maybe a metre an hour. Of course, this is Rangitoto, so it's all cooled and solidified. And this is a, the style of surface you get on these lava flows that were very viscous. And it's uh, given the Hawaiian name Aa, uh, named by little Hawaiian boys running over to bare feet. <laughs> Uh, just a, another little uh, aside from the combination of the fire fountain, which produced the scoria cone of Mangakikia, or One Tree Hill. You can see it's got three craters here. This one's completely surrounded by a scoria cone. There's one high point. Why do you think we've got one high point of scoria there? It's from the wind, all right? So the a fire fountain out of this crater here towards the very end of the eruption. The wind was blowing from the south west and a lot of it ended up building up a peak on one side. These two craters here have been breached to the side here. They're horseshoe shaped, if you like, or breached craters. And what's happened there is that the, the hot molten magma has come up inside the throat of the volcano, pushed its way through the base of the scoria cone and flowed out. It's rafted away any scoria cone that had built up here. If more landed on it, that was rafted away with it as well. So these are breached craters. This one and the, the archery crater here are breached. The lavas flowed out from there and carried away any scoria uh, ramparts that were there with the lava flows that went off. And when the lava flows cool, they cool into a, a dense basalt rock that we see all around Auckland, right here, uh, <laughs> and in the curbs on the roads, etc is the solidified lava flows of a dense basalt. 
Some of the la thickest lava flows, such as this, come from Mount Eden. If the lava pours out, poured out on the isthmus, where it was, uh, had been eroded into valleys and ridges, etc., the lava flows got into the, the valleys and flowed like a river down the valley. But over here at Atuatau, this is the area we're talking about mostly here, was flat Manukau Flats. And so the lava that came out from around the base of the, the scoria cones flowed out like an apron all around. So here we had Puki Tutu, and right around it we have an apron of lava flows that flowed out in all directions to build up the lava flow fields of that particular volcano. So that brings us to the volcanoes of this area here. We'll start in the south. How am I going for time? Manatakitaki here, or Alex Mountain, is the southernmost. Here it is here, or was here. So here it was in uh, 1950. A campaign was launched to try and protect this beautiful little volcano, Mangatakitaki, but unfortunately it was not successful as we know. And here it is in 2009, quarried down below sea level. It has gone. So, this particular volcano, first of all, it started with an explosive eruption that threw out the ash, and we got a tough ring built up right around an explosion crater in the middle. So this is the, the tough ring coming around, around in here, and this is the explosion crater in the middle, in here. As shown in here, this is the, the tough ring crater rim. There's this B here, and the scoria cones in the middle later on are inside C there where it's been quarried. And we see lovely exposures through the tough ring and the tuff that was erupted through the coastal section in here. So here's some of that exposure, coastal exposure of the volcanic ash, the tuff. And this was the ground level when Mangatakitaki erupted, and there was a forest growing there. And those pyroclastic blasts that, or surges that came out sideways knocked the tops off many of them, flattened many of the smaller trees. The top had come off here, all the branches landed on the ground, all the, the leaves were stripped from the branches. The fossil cowrie trees in the foreshore there are not the forest that was killed by the eruption. They are the preserved remains of a, an older fossil on the same so, a fossil forest on the same site. So here's a, a, um, a, a schematic, if you like, of those first explosive eruptions breaking through, throwing out some of the fragmented rising magma and also some of the, a lot of the fragmented country rock high into the air and knocking the trees over and then starting to bury them. Here's a branch, for example, lying horizontally within the, the base of the ash. You can see the ash layers have actually gone up and over it to bury it. We can also see some of the leaves in those lower layers of ash at the uh, end of Renton Road. Here we have Kari, Tanikaha and Miro here, indicating some of the kinds of trees and forest that was growing there at the time. Here are some of the blocks of country rock that were ripped up from the, th the uh, sides of the throat of the volcano and thrown out as blocks and landed in the ash, forming these small impact craters as they landed. These ones here are probably uh, white matters here. There are big blocks, these are a metre across, actually of Tikawiti limestone, oligocene that were thrown out from this particular volcano. Uh, so this is the area where we're looking, in the cliff section here. This is the Kauri forest, the older Kauri forest in the foreshore, and the trees are just at the base of the ash in here. And the, the tuff is thickest here, and as you get further and further away from the, the volcano, it moves from about 10 metre thick to about 2 metre thick, uh, moving away from the, the centre of that explosive blast. Here we can see the tough ring being built up in the schematic here. And here again are the two, two examples of these accretionary lapilli from, uh, from uh, Mangatakitaki, this one here. This one's very interesting in cross-section. It looks like the insides are more basaltic in composition and they've got a layer on the outside more made up of fragmented country rock, the, the, probably the Pleistocene rhyolitic sediments that it came up through the whiter layers around each of these little balls that were deposited there. Then we, we used up all the water, so the explosive style of eruption died down and we switched to dry eruptions. We started to get the fountaining from several different craters. 
building up a double cone. There's a high point here, another high point here. There's a bit of a crater in here, another crater in here that were the last craters active. There probably were different craters in different positions earlier on uh, that are now filled in. This one's 70 metres high. Here's a cross section again of the building up inside the explosion crater with a tough ring on either side. And then some of the, the, the uh, flat magma with very little gas pushed out through the base of the scoria cone and flowed out into the explosion crater between the scoria cones and the tough ring. So here in red I've outlined where those lava flows are. There are the orange areas in this map here, and the pink areas are the scoria cones. So these are the scor scoria cone here, and the lava flowed out from around the base into the uh, there's the edge of the tough ring coming around here. So it filled the moat in here, extended out more to the to the southwest and hit in this direction. Everybody see that? Mm -hmm. And you'll notice it's not very rocky on top of these particular lava flows. In fact, I think somewhere we said the uh, Mangatakitaki's recently been dated at around 84,000 years. So it's quite an old volcano in the area, and I believe it's not so rocky on the lava flows here, A, because they've been there longer weathering, and the forests have grown up and leaf leaves have built up, but also there have been ash from a number of other eruptions uh, mantled the top, mm -hmm. over the top of these rocky lava flows. And so it's fairly smooth, with just a few rocks sticking out. It. And then we have the strange lobe of lava here to the south. There's a, a quarry here among the Takitaki, this is the lava flow field, and the strange lobe here that was built on the urgings of conservationists, or should we say ornithologists, oh. who, who, or, or the airport maybe, as a roosting ground for the seabirds to try and attract them away from the airport when it was first put in. <laughs> so that the uh, sea bit, the gulls, etc., wouldn't be quite such a hazard for the aeroplanes. I haven't seen it being terribly... Has anybody from out that way ever seen a bird on it? <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather like it to be taken away myself. So then we come to a few historic photos, some of which you may or may not have seen, uh, of uh, Mangataki Taki. This is 1899, by Scarwin, taken from the north. You can see the highest point here, the scoria cone. And here again, we can see the highest point. This is 1949, before any quarrying began. That's a bit closer up. You can see it's a little bit of a road starting to get going up here. Maybe it's a farm road that was later used for the quarrying. There's a gym. You mentioned gym, didn't you? Golson, I oh, know you would mention fair field, didn't you? Jim Golson also flew in the 1915. It's Seven it was. Goulston. Goulston. Goulston, is it? Yes, that's not true. G-O-L-S-O-N, it says here. Jack Goulston. Jack. Jack, Jack, I'm sorry, not Jim. Jack. Jack, Jack Goulston. Yes. So it says Jack, that should be, I apologise, and for some reason it's got... I can now see query 57 there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, this is uh, from the ground, this one's from the air. You can see this lovely crater here. That's that uh, westernmost crater and this road coming through here. And this is 1960, and you can just see the start of quarrying on this part among the Taki here. And 1962, there's that one there, and look, this was the start of the main quarrying in 1962 on Taki. Here we've got in 1988, 94, and 2009. I'm afraid, farewell the everlasting mountain. That's the Maori, the English translation of Mangataki Taki. Was that associated the with the mountain. development of the airport in uh, 1962? 62, yeah. is that? Yeah, I think that is correct. It may have been when it started, of course, it's been going on right through to the present time. So a lot of it's been used in many different jobs since then. I think the quarry owner uh, made the argument that it was right on the flat path. Was right on the flight path. A flight path. Yes. So well, they thought it would be a good idea to lower it. <laughs> well, unfortunately, that land now is uh, zoned for development. Air, I think it's is it for airport business zone or something. Is that right? I think so. Some of yes. Will be so it might be on the flight path, but they're going to build on it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the next one we're going to talk about is, is 
the tour tower itself. Okay. So here's my little map of it. And here, here's uh, the cone. Here it is in 2009. The cone has been quarried out completely. And there was a minor amount, we see a minor amount of tuff uh, on the south and east sides around here. I'm not quite sure whether this crater is, is dammed between part of the tuff ring of this uh, Atua Tower and the Scoria Cone, or whether it's uh, a combination of tuff from, from several different volcanoes that dam little valley was created. Does anybody get know about that? I think it's all speculation as to whether that's a volcanic related crater or not. So this is looking down on the cone of a tour tower in 1960. You can see it's already been stuck into by the quarrying. And you can see the shape of it here. It's a U-shape. So this out to the west here has been breached by lava flows. And this part of the scoria cone has been rafted away. And the main crater, I guess, area was here. So the, there it is here. The scoria cone, and as you can see here, all the lava flows appear to have gone out to the west from where the, the crater was breached in here. And so here I've outlined what I believe are the, the lava flow fields from that particular volcano to a tower. And essentially it's all the rubbly areas, the rocky areas through here, probably suggesting it, that it's the youngest of the, the three volcanoes in this area, and that most of these flows have not been mantled de very deeply at all by ash, although there is some areas in here that have got quite a bit of mantling by ash that we still don't completely understand. So here's a 1964 vertical photo or a vertical oblique. Here's the, the U-shape and the breaching of the scoria cone, and you can see the lava flows coming out here. You can even see, even see the levees on either side of the flow. So flow coming down here, the levee here, and in the middle, another flow coming down through here. And you can see the levee down on either side, on the side of it. What a shame we don't have that left anymore. Because it was quarried away here. Uh, when was that? The 1980s, I think. This is the area of quarrying of the lava flow field that was done before it was purchased as a historic reserve. And here's the edge of the lava flows, as you can see through here. And this is uh, part of that area of the lava flows up the top there that was quarried away next to the decapitated uh, scoria cone. And this lovely little exposure here of scoria shows us several interesting features. This is looking down at the quarried away part of the lava flow field with Maureen smiling here as she is in. Here's a dike. <laughs> Going through the scoria here. So that's a, 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 sheet, a sheet of lava pushing its way up through the loose scoria. Probably possibly came to the top and may have uh, just pushed out a little bit of liquid lava on top of that scoria. So it's quite unusual to have a dike so close to the surface of a scoria cone. And right on the other side of it, we actually have some rootless lava flows. They may have actually been fed by that dike or there may have been some very molten uh, fountaining landing a higher up and it's flowed off down on top of the, the slopes. So that's the original slope there of the scoria cone when that lava flowed down the side, those very thin bits of flow. So those are still exposed in that quarry face in the reserve. A little bit further down towards the coast, there's an exposure where we can actually see this uh, baked clay this is a natural brick, if you like, and it's been baked by the lava flow coming over a, a pond of clay water. And it's baked that clay, and it's developed these hexagonal prisms in that natural brick there. Very interesting, on the side of the lava flow field, there's this one very small lava lobe that's broken out from the, the carapace here, and it's flowed out in this direction across the paddock. Mm. And you can see it coming out from here, flowing out into the paddock there very narrow lobe of lava that's like a, a rat's tail, I guess. Among a tucky tucky and a tour tower that's already been quarried prior to 1949. And again, 
Well, I see uh, evidence is that the quarrying started on a tour tower prior to 1914. Uh, and it accelerated it in the 50s and 60s, and it essentially stopped in 1988. Well, I should say that essentially the quarrying of the Scoria cone was uh, stopped by 1988, essentially. This is the 1960 photo, that you see it before. 1990, 1994. It's quite uh, overgrown, the, this area by that time, wasn't it? There's, uh, a tour tower cone here, this is the, the lava flow field in here. 1992 and 2009. So there was a, la a late phase once it had become a reserve just to clean up some of the last bits of lava in there and created a bowl shaped area in the quarry of what was formerly their tour tower so, uh, scoria cone. Is that artificial down the bottom where the sand is? What do you say? <laughs> yes. Right. <laughs> then one want to explain why, why it's there? I suppose it's uh, to stop, try and stop erosion or something, isn't it? Mm -hmm. no? Okay, that brings us to the next one. This is Otua Tower, and just next to it is the little score, or just the little cone of Pukiiti, Papa Tanga, Ahape. And it's lava flow field. Here it is here. Many of you will re remember that or know that. There's looking down almost vertically onto it, a small crater and a small mound. And looking at the exposures in these old quarry holes, we see that it's made up of a lot of spatter, which is fairly dense uh, lava, not as frothy as scoria which seems to suggest that there wasn't a great deal of gas coming out at this vent. The, la the, the magma coming up was just spluttering out splatter that built up only a very small cone around the vent, whereas a large amount of lava poured out from around this area to form the lava flow field out to the north and west. In fact, so much that we built up a small half shield, if you like, with these very gentle sort of 5 to 10 degree slopes on these lava flows coming down from the centre of the, or the, the vent. So here's the outline of the, the uh, lava flow field from Pukiiti, all this area through here, and our tour towers out to, next to it, just to the south there. And there's the cone right there. This is the, the area of land that's under threat. Out the, uh, the east side of Pukiiti. It doesn't appear to have had a lava flows go out under there, but will of course have a, a capping of ash from here and probably several of the other volcanoes over the top of the, the Manukau lowlands in that area. Some of the lava flows in Pukiiti have very distinctive trenches with leve sides that indicate the direction of some of the flows. They flowed down quite liquid. They may have uh, cooled on top and had a little bit of a a carapace cap over the top. When all the lava flowed out, it collapsed in like a collapsed lava cave, and we have these trenches that you can walk down. And here, are some of them indicated from a cone here. Here's one of them that we've just seen there. This trench with a levee on either side. Another one here, and uh, another one going out that direction. And you'll notice again, it's not as rocky on the surface as adjacent to a tour tower. It seems to have had more ash over the top, mantled over it. Maybe it's slightly a bit older than its uh, neighbour, I don't know. But certainly it's not as rocky and I think it's got a lot more ash and soil over the top of it. Also in this volcanic field, in the lava flow field, there are several lava caves that our colleague Peter Crosley uh, has worked in and mapped. There's Lino Lava Cave down here that's underneath this area, and there's one just over the fence of the, of the reserve here, in the private land. It's uh, up for development here, Rubbish Lava Cave. Here's Peter's map of the two. This is Lino Lava Cave here. It's uh, about 80 metres long, and here's Rubbish, Rubbish Pit Cave, it's got here, and it's what, about 60 metres long. 
Here's the entrance to, to Lino Lava Cave, a little field. Now, I haven't mentioned lava caves, but lava caves only form within lava flows. You don't get them in the scoria cones or the, the tuff, the, the volcanic ash. So as the lava flows flowing down, it's got cooled uh, carapace of cooled basalt lava over the top and possibly on the sides, but it's still molten lava on the inside, like a hose with water in it. When the supply of, of magma from the vent shuts off, then this lava, molten lava, may flow out and will be left with a hollow tube going up on the inside. That's the lava cave. They only form in lava flows, and generally access to them is where the, the roof of the cave collapses, where it's thin perhaps, to get into the cave, walk up a, a, or, or climb or squiggle up a, a short section before we come to a roof collapse or something that's blocked it again. So lava caves longer than 100 metres are, are very rare in the Auckland field, and lava caves in New Zealand are restricted to the Auckland volcanic field. This is a photo I've taken from Peter. This is inside Lino Lava Cave. It got its name from this here. This is Lino that they lined the squeeze with. It was so rough, it ripped you apart and your clothing apart as you squeeze through this terrible hole to get in, or in through part of it. So this is the, the Lino lined squeeze in Lino Lava Cave. Any volunteers? <laughs> so that's the lava caves. And here's the 1899 picture uh, of Pukiiti from the top of the tour tower, I guess. Here's Mungari Mountain here, and Waitomo here over here. And quarrying, according to Les Commode, this quarrying here occurred in 1928. That's the information I have. Anybody got any other information? It's what he told me to. It's what you told you to, all right. <laughs> so that was uh, Pukiiti, this the one here. What's the time going? Do you want me to stop there or carry on? Carry on. Yeah. Shall we do quickly go a bit faster through these? Good. All right, so here's Waitomokia here. Or Moirangi. Or Mount Gabriel, and here it is here. This is the tough ring around it, the explosion crater, the swamp filling it, and score three score or three cones in the middle, as you can see there. And no lava flows came from this particular one. This is Hochstetter's sketch map of it, the three cones here, and the tough ring crest going around it, and a cross section. This is just some of the tough and some of the bombs that were coming out or blocks ripped off uh, from the country rock it came through. Historic photos, 1899, looking down into some of the crater, one, two, three cones in the middle. Three again, 1899. And again here, 1949. You can see the swamp here. 49 again. Here you can see a tour tower and Mangatakitaki and Pukiiti and Wetumakia. Yeah, 1949 from this angle with Pukitutu Island out the back there. 1955, and we're just getting the very first little bit of quarrying on one of the, the cones in here. Here you can see it. The Metropolitan Drainage Board began quarrying <coughs> the southeast cone in 1955 for the sewage treatment plant. Here again, 1955, 57. You can see there's more of it's gone in here. Quite a lot of quarrying in here. Beautiful little cone here. Jack Golson. Here, here they were trying to stop the quarrying. There was quite a campaign mounted in, 19, in the mid 1950s with Jack being one of the leading players. But they didn't seem to save any of the ones that the cones in the south at that time. They did manage to get a bit of the quarrying stock with some of the, the more central cones. Here you can see the quarrying, and these ones are yet to go. This is uh, 1958. You can see they're getting into the other, other two as well. And this is uh, a modern image, and these are the legal boundaries 
around the, the footprints of those three cones. This is Villa Maria's land, and this is this business area here. So the footprint is still there if we wanted to rebuild the three cones in the middle of Waitemokia. You'll notice it's CV of these two properties, six million. So that's these areas in here. And here's Villa Maria's vineyard up through here. <coughs> Pukitutu, it's Pukitutu Island, you can see it's uh, got tuff ring remnants here, here and here, with the lava flows going over the top of the tuff ring and burying it in most places, but there's three parts of that circular tuff ring around an explosion crater that we can still see, here's one of them, nice and smooth ash. Uh, I think this is another bit in here, yes, there and there are these two northern areas. Here's uh, what's left of the, the scoria cones, crater here, and there's feet in the southeast down here, so it's only this half here that's left today. That may be a Fairfield photograph. You can see all the cones before any quarrying had started, and some of the lovely garden areas in here. Again, 1946, before any quarrying. And you'll see this quarrying has started up in here in the 1950s again. Probably related to the drainage board again, was it? 1949, lots of garden sites all through here on top of the lava flow field. So the lava flows poured out to the west and to the south, out to the east here, and over the top of the tuff ring a little bit out here to the north. We're going through quickly. It too has got a very narrow little lava flow that's broken free and, and flowed out over the Manukau lowlands here. And here's another view of the, the lava flow fields. The scoria cones have been quarried out here, and a lot of the lava flows all through this area have all been taken out. And now uh, they have an agreement that these areas here will be refilled with dry, treated sewage from the sewage works and over a 30 or 40 year period gradually build up Pukitutu Island and hopefully in 30 to 40 years we'll be able to argue that the, the former shape of the scoria cones on the very top can be recreated. But at the time they were getting permission for this, the water, board, water care people said it was too expensive to do so to dry out the, the solid wastes so that they would retain those sorts of 30 degree slopes. But I think in 30 or so years' time, the technology and the, the will hopefully will be there so that we can create, recreate the former tops of all the scoria cones on the top of that fill. Shall I stop there?